Recall from our earlier lessons that the plasma membrane serves as a guard for the cell and monitors what is let in and out of the cell. The membrane is semi-permeable, meaning that it only lets certain things pass through. Anything else that wants to enter or leave the cell must do so via special proteins embedded in the membrane called transport proteins. The channel protein labeled on this slide is one type of transport protein. The plasma membrane also serves to maintain the resting potential of the cell. This simply means that at rest, the cell prefers to have a more negative charge when compared to the outside of the cell. Sodium and potassium ions help to maintain the negative charge in the cell. However, sodium and potassium ions are also needed for cellular work, and the two channel proteins responsible for their transport tend to be leaky. This means that the cell must continually work to maintain the proper sodium and potassium ion concentrations in order to produce that negative charge it wants so badly. It is the sodium-potassium pump's responsibility to move the sodium and potassium ions in order to gain back the negative charge inside the cell. Earlier, we learned that ions tend to travel from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. Using the channel proteins, sodium and potassium ions travel across their concentration gradient, and this requires no energy from the cell. We term this passive transport. However, getting the ions back to their proper sides requires moving them out of that preferred low concentration back to the higher concentration. This does require cellular work, and we call this active transport. The cell uses ATP to power the sodium-potassium pump. Let's take a closer look at how the sodium-potassium pump actually works. In step one, the transport protein has a high affinity for sodium ions inside the cell. It can transport three sodium ions at once. The image shows three sodium ions entering the pump. Once the sodium ions are situated in the pump, an ATP molecule donates one of its phosphates to the transport protein, becoming a molecule of ADP. This process is called phosphorylation. The donation of the phosphate provides the energy for the protein to undergo a conformational change, which causes the protein to open to the outside and lose its affinity for the sodium ions. With nothing holding the sodium ions in place, they move out of the protein and into the extracellular matrix. The protein pump now has an affinity for potassium ions outside of the cell, and two of these ions can now enter the pump. This prompts the phosphate to detach, a process called dephosphorylation. The loss of the phosphate prompts the pump to return to its earlier conformation and open to the inside of the cell. The conformational change results in the pump losing its affinity for the potassium ions and they are free to exit the pump and enter the cell. The pump is now in its original conformation and ready to repeat the procedure. Because the protein pump pumps three sodium ions out for every two potassiums in, it is capable of creating a negative net charge inside the cell, returning the cell to its resting state. Study the entire diagram of the sodium-potassium pump until you feel comfortable with how it works. Tomorrow in class, you and your group mates will get the chance to create your own model of the sodium-potassium pump and demonstrate how it works.